My name is Melissa Johnston. Um, I, when I finished high school, I really did not know what I wanted to do, and I suspect there may be uh, some of you who are also in a similar situation. I did think that the area of helping people or making a positive difference in people's lives was, that was quite appealing to me. Um, and so I did get drawn to the area of psychology. Um, and from there, I just really followed um, my, my interests and, and what I thought was, sounded really interesting and what I enjoyed. And I'm really pleased that it did that because it has led me into a career that I do really enjoy. Um, so I did my, my BA when I first left high school, back in, finished in 1999, which was quite a while ago. Uh, then I took a couple of years off and went and studied and travelled overseas. Um, I then studied my master's in New Zealand for a couple of years, that was in 2005-ish. And then I did my PhD about five, six years ago. And as Casey mentioned, I'm currently lecturing at Macquarie University and I've been here for about a year and a half. So for many people who don't know exactly what they want to do when they finish high school, I think that the, the idea of making a positive difference in people's lives and helping people is really quite appealing. Um, and there are many positives to a career in health and helping people. And as I said, I think making a positive difference in people's lives is, uh, is one of the big factors the people that I uh, work with and colleagues of mine, they're either working on a one-on-one -on -one basis with individuals who may be supporting individuals getting out of a difficult situation, or they may be working at a more community level where they're developing programs and support, which is going to um, have a positive impact upon the community. And going home every night and thinking that you're having a positive difference in someone's life is, is really quite rewarding. And I think it does contribute to someone's own sense of personal growth. You're meeting a lot of interesting people along the way. You're working with a lot of good people. Um, and it is likely in the field of health and helping that you will move into a few different roles. And so the, that, with that, it, it creates your own sort of personal journey where you're continually developing new skills and meeting new people and trying different things. And the other thing is that it's a really growing industry. So the Australian government has predicted that it's the fastest growing field um, what they see over the next five to 10 years, this field of health and social assistance. So that I find is always something that um, parents like to hear. They like to hear that their, their child will be going into a field that, where there will be positions available. So I think before we sort of talk about more specific careers in health and helping, I think it is useful just to think about what we mean by health. Um, and probably the most widely used definition of health is from the World Health Organization. And they say that health is a state of complete physical, emotional and social well-being, and not merely the absence of disease or infirmity. So there's a couple of key things there, just to keep in mind as we go through the presentation, that when we think about health, yes, we do think about physical health, like our physical being and if we're feeling sick or feeling a bit unwell, um, but it also encompasses our emotional well-being. So if we're feeling sad, if we're feeling depressed, we're feeling anxious, we're feeling happy, that is also really important for health. And the final component, the third one there, is social well-being. So it encompasses uh, the environment in which we live, our social relationships, our social connections. Um, and within this definition, all three components are really important for health and they're connected as well. So when we think about health, we're not just thinking, I'm healthy because I'm not feeling sick. We start to think about health as being more of a, a continuum where we've got disease and ill health down the kind of negative end. But then we think about a real positive end as well, where we've got optimal wellness at the other end. And we can think about ourselves and, and other people throughout our life as sort of moving along this continuum. So there'll be times when we are feeling unwell um, and experiencing poor health, but there will be times when we're in quite good health. And working in health and where we're seeing a lot of the careers in health is about trying to encourage and promote the bulk of the population to be in a state of optimal wellness. And that can be through trying to encourage people to engage in, in good health behaviours um, and promote positive mental health, 
so that we can try and shift the bulk of the population to being in a state of good health. So it's probably good just to keep in mind that we're, when we think about health, we've got a very broad definition of health and we're not just thinking about disease anymore and, and not being sick. We're thinking about trying to encourage to be, people to be really healthy when they're, when they're not sick. And so I think when we do take this broad view of health, it does open up a lot more opportunities in the field of health and helping people. Um, that we're not just thinking about people going to the doctor or going to see a nurse. We're, we're thinking about more program development, more community development, and ways to uh, reach a, a bigger group of people to promote health at a bigger level. And so I did want to tell you very briefly about some of the work that I've done um, with people experiencing homelessness and trying to promote better health amongst people experiencing homelessness. Um, so this was some work that I did with the Salvation Army and it was very rewarding work and I, you know, it was such a good opportunity to be able to actually go out into the Salvation Army shelters and, and talk to people. Um, and what we were trying to do is we were trying to assist those people who were experiencing a state of homelessness who then got out of a state of homelessness, but then who were likely to relapse back into homelessness. And we were trying to stop that point where people would relapse back into homelessness. And so we're trying to think about what, else, what other skills, what other strengths can we draw upon for, for this population to try to prevent relapse back into homelessness. So to give you some information, on any night, that one in 200 people in Australia are experiencing homelessness. So that is quite a large number. It's about 100,000 people in the population. Um, not all of these people are sleeping on the streets. Some are um, in, in shelters, in boarding houses, um, and some are, many are staying in what we call overcrowded housing, where there's just so many people for the number of rooms available in the, in the accommodation. The work that I did, we were looking at people who were experiencing a state of homelessness in New South Wales, Victoria or Queensland. And there's some stats there just to give you an indication of where the population of people experiencing homelessness is spread across the population. And you see that the Northern Territory does tend to have the highest rate of homelessness when we're looking at per 10,000 people in the population. It's quite a high number. People often ask why are people experiencing homelessness? Um, sometimes you'll come across people who say, oh, well, you know, they should just go get a job and get out of a state of homelessness. Um, if it was that simple, it would be great. But we do find that people who are experiencing homelessness tend to come from really, uh, experiencing really difficult circumstances. They tend to be experiencing very severe financial difficulties. Um, they're ex going through a period of housing crisis, a period of unemployment. Um, and domestic and family violence is also a big contributor and why it's so important to have shelters available to be able to provide some accommodation for, for people who um, don't find themselves having anywhere to live. Because the issue, as you probably get the picture that because it is so complex and so multifaceted and the reasons for homelessness are so varied, that it really does require a collaborative approach. And this is one really positive thing about working in health and helping, is that you tend to work with some really great people. If you were working in the area of homelessness, you know, some of the factors that we'd want to be thinking about are, are policies that affect people who are experiencing homelessness, the role that health professionals play uh, to assist people who are homeless, psychologists, um, people who work in the shelters, um, employment and trying to get people back into a state of employment and back into a state of housing. It would be, I think it would be impossible for one person to try and achieve all of those things and that's why we really emphasise in the area of health and helping that it really does require a collaborative approach, that it requires talking to people in policy, talking to people who can sort out you know, housing, offering housing, at the same time working with people and psychologists and health professionals to try and promote better mental health amongst people who are experiencing homelessness. And so this was my team when we uh, were doing some work with the Salvation Army, and these are some of my former colleagues back at UQ. And I did just want to point out in the middle there we've got Catherine Philpot, and she is a psychologist, but she was heavily involved in the Salvation Army and was really kind of our our key piece in the puzzle that got us connected with the Salvation Army and uh, enabled this work to be done. Uh, above her in the picture is Cameron, and he was very heavily into policy and writing for policy uh, in the area of homelessness. So what we were doing, what we, our approach, 
was that we do know that people who are in a state of homelessness are more likely to experience poor well-being, both emotional well-being and physical well-being and social well-being. And there are many factors that contribute to that. So being in a state of poverty where one doesn't have somewhere safe to live, they don't have enough money for food, enough money to pay their bills, it does contribute to you know, poor psychological health. And a state of uncertainty as well, not knowing whether one is going to be able to get back on track and get out of a state of homelessness also contributes to poorer wellbeing. And it is common as well for people who are experiencing homelessness to report experiencing discrimination as well. And this is, has neg you know, really negative effects on people's health. And so what we were trying to do is we understood that there was a relationship between homelessness and poor wellbeing and some of the factors that contributed to that. But we wanted to think about well, what can we offer or what can we build upon that would enable people to have a better wellbeing? What could enhance their sense of wellbeing? Because this might be a protective factor in preventing them from relapsing back into homelessness. So it was really trying to build on what strengths that people in homelessness have. And our approach was really around this multiple group identity approach. Um, and the main theory around this and the main assumption around this theory is that the more groups that people are members of, the stronger their sense of identity and there is a strong link with people's emotional well-being. Uh, and to give you an example of what I mean by group membership, um, I've drawn up this example here and um, th this may reflect someone who's listening to this talk that, you know, if you think about yourself, you're a part, you're in high school, so you're a part of a, a student group, you're a member of that group. Some of you may be affiliated with different sporting clubs, so you're a member of that group as well. Um, some may be involved in a church group, and so you're a member of that group as well. And you've got all these different groups. And there is a, a lot of research out there that suggests that the more groups that we're a member of, the better our health, the better our emotional health. Uh, it's not the number of friends that we have, the number of groups that we're attached to, we're involved with, because it helps create a sense of purpose, a sense of identity. So we took this approach and thought, well, is there anything, does this, does this relate to people who are experiencing homelessness as well? And if so, what could we do to try and enhance their sense of well-being? And we did find a relationship there. So we did find that when people were experiencing homelessness, when they had a positive experience of the Salvation Army, they were more likely to join more groups. And then this, was, this predicted better well-being as well. And so this was really positive for the Salvation Army because this is something that they can implement. They can they can um, structure their programs so that people have more opportunities to join more groups and develop more groups and have those group memberships as a way to kind of build people's sense of well-being. It's the overall goal that it would help people prevent them relapse back into homelessness. So that was some really interesting work and it's still ongoing as well and the Salvation Army is, is using those findings and, and incorporating it into their programs. So that was one thing that I have done. I also wanted to talk to you a bit about adolescent health because I thought this you know is an area that you might be particularly interested in considering you're going through that period yourself uh, and it is considered a national priority as well and the reason for this is that it is considered a time of considerable change and development both physically um, but also in terms of um, life, life stages so many of you will be thinking about finishing school um, I'm not sure what age you are at the moment because I can't see you um, but either this year or in a couple of years and then you might be thinking about undertaking further study or going into work um, or traveling and so it is a period of considerable change. Um, it's also we've also found that it's a time when habitual patterns of health behaviors can develop so this is really important for people working in health that we really they really want to find ways to encourage young people to engage in good health behaviours. So engage in physical activity and eating nutritious food and you know, not smoking, because these, this period sets the pathway for adult life. So it's really important to kind of get in at this period of time to help people develop more stable health behaviours. So when we're thinking about adolescent health, so you're probably thinking, well, that's quite broad. Where would you focus on? And areas of priority uh, and all the work that we do in health is determined through research. There are, there are national surveys that are uh, in place to determine what areas are, are important to young people. Um, there is a lot of health data out there and other measures of health 
do get used as a way for us to determine or what are the areas of priority that we need to swoop in and focus on and work with young people as well. So one of the things about health is that it's not just about, it's not telling people what they should do, it's working with people um, in a way that will help people take control over their health and pro provide them with a sense of empowerment where they can feel they can take control over their health. So one example, and this, um, you know, the, the fortunate thing about being as old as I am is that I've seen so much in the way of change in the way of trying to prevent young people from smoking. Um, so when I was young, many years ago, there was actually a time where my friend and I were sent to the, to the shops by her parents to buy cigarettes for them. We've seen massive changes that would never happen today. Um, it would not be allowed. We've seen so much change in, in legislation. But what we have found is it's still an area of priority in trying to prevent people from taking up smoking in the first place because there is such a strong link with so many um, diseases that historically we have found that teenage boys tended to be more likely than teenage girls to start smoking. And this data that I'm showing here is from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, a national health survey taken from 2008 to 2007 to 2008. And you've probably seen campaigns like that, have, the, the, like these, sorry, that have been put into place. So posters, TV commercials that try to encourage people to not smoke in the first place. Um, and the, working in the area of health, there's a lot of research that goes into this. What what would we target that would most like would have the most impact in preventing people from starting to smoke in the first place? Um, so there's a lot of research in trying to understand the target population and what messages people will listen to. So, you, you know, you might see things on the TV that are encouraging people to be healthier, but some of them can be quite lame and, you know, a bit, a bit dorky. And so, you, you know, you can't just kind of dismiss them. So there's a lot of work. And, you know, and we always want good people to be able to try to find ways and research ways that are going to be relatable to people so people actually listen to the message and take it on board. So as well as posters, TV commercials, so you've probably seen some of those disgusting commercials that they have on the TV where they go into people's bodies and, and um, see how smoking affects their lungs and other body parts. As I mentioned, we've also had massive changes in legislation. So, you know, the tobacco industry can't advertise at sporting events anymore. They can't sell it, uh, product to minors. And the plain packaging as well is a recent one that we have seen in Australia is the leader in that, is the first country in the world to develop that. And the tobacco industry hated it as well because they, they knew it would affect um, their sales. More recently, we have started to see that teenage girls are actually slightly more likely than teenage boys to start smoking. And in response to that, there has been more campaigns targeted at young girls and what they think will reach more young girls in trying to prevent them from starting to smoke in the first place. Another area of health behaviour where we're trying to think about encouraging people to engage in good health behaviour is the area of physical activity. Um, and I wanted to show you a little bit on sedentary behaviour. So this, when we think about sedentary behaviour, it's actually what I'm doing now, just sitting on my bottom, not being physically active. But we found that in the overall in the population, a, a good portion of the population, the majority of the population, we consider sedentary. They're not engaging in sufficient amount of physical activity to protect their health. And we find that the teenage years uh, and into the early 20s are a really crucial point to try and um, swoop in and, and do something about that. So we see when we're looking at sedentary behaviour that for 15 to 17 year olds, particularly boys, there's reasonably compared to the rest of the population, sedentary behaviour is relatively low, it's just over 30%. But as people get older, the likelihood of being sedentary and not engaging in our physical activity increases. So again, like working in health, there is a lot of campaigns and programs and research being done in trying to develop commercials, to develop posters and messages that are going to encourage people to want to engage in more physical activity. And they, the Australian government at the moment has ideas for you know, being more active, just in terms of thinking about how we get to school, how we get to work, um, the, how we spend our leisure time, so not, not spending our time, too much time in front of the TV, but actually being more active. And at the same time that these programs or campaigns are being developed, these health messages are being developed, there are other people who are working in other areas that are going to 
help people engage in more physical activity. So as I said earlier, it always takes a, 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 multi, a, a team, a collaborative approach. And so there are people who are constantly trying to work with the government to implement more cycle pathways or, you know, around the country as a way to kind of make it easier for people to be able to jump on a bike and um, be, more, be more active. Um, because we know that one of the barriers that's stopping people from doing that is that they don't want to get hit by a car. Um, and so there's constantly, it's the same time that people are developing health messages, other people are trying to change the environment and change legislation and, and do other things that are going to encourage people to, to do more, be more active. Uh, I did want to say one of the key priorities for adolescent health is mental health. Um, that is seen by the Australian government as a really crucial thing to focus on. We do say we do see tend to see higher rates of mental health problems in young people compared to um, the older population. So this is a really key area for the government, and maybe something that you'd be interested in working in um, when you finish school. You might have to do some training, but then you might be interested in going back into the school environment and trying to help develop programs that are going to help people um, have better mental health. And I briefly wanted to go through the Mind Matters program um, that you may uh, be familiar with if it's implemented in your school. And I just want to say that, you know, as health professionals, there's been a lot of research into this and, and what would work in developing this kind of multi-pronged approach. Uh, and it is really about trying to prevent mental health problems in the first place and promoting positive mental health by taking by focusing on four key areas. Um, and the first one is focusing on having a positive school community. So this is about, so this program, it, it develops resources and, and, and tips for schools and teachers and, and the community to try and find ways to promote good mental health amongst young people. And the first component of that, creating that positive school environment. And there is, there is some resources there on for, for schools to, find ways to promote a positive school environment, a positive mental health school environment. So be focusing on things like, you know, recognising diversity in schools, um, having a very inclusive approach in a school and having that positive school environment. A second, the second component is targeting adolescents and helping them build their, their own skills for resilience. Um, and again, there are some training guides for staff and for, for students themselves to think about, um, to be able to do activities and think about ways to try and promote and build their own resilience in the face of difficult life circumstances. There's a component focused on more parents and families and working with parents and, and communities as ways that can help um, promote positive mental health amongst young people. And then the final component is for students who are experiencing mental health difficulties, having an approach in place that is going to support those individuals. So largely it is about prevention and preventing mental health problems from the first, from the first instance, but obviously having a plan in place for students and young people who are experiencing mental health problems, having avenues for them to be able to, to, to seek help. So this is a... a um, an approach that has been adopted in primary schools as well, kind of focusing on the schools, the students, the families, and then having um, a pathway for those experiencing poor mental health or mental health problems. Um, so it is a, a multifactorial approach. It requires a collaborative team approach, and it is based on research as well that we, you know, these things aren't just developed just hoping that that will work. It is based on what we know about um, mental health and young people. I did want to just give you some examples of some jobs that are currently advertised at the moment too. I know it's, you know, I've talked about some areas where you could potentially work, but these actually are currently advertised positions. And some of them are really interesting. As I was doing research for them, I thought, well, you know, some of these, the project worker for the child, youth and family, it sounds really good that maybe I'd be interested in applying for that job myself. Um, but the, I think these do give you a flavour for the kinds of things that you could be thinking about working, uh, the kind of roles you could be thinking about working in. So the project worker, the program coordinator, these are all about developing programs that are going to promote better mental health amongst young people. Um, so again, it is, the role is, and the programs are based on research and what we know works. 
um, but it is about developing programs and implementing them in the community and working with stakeholders, working with schools um, and working with uh, organisations to try and find ways that would promote better mental health. There's also more one-on-one -on -one opportunities available. So if you were interested in you know, helping individual who were, individuals who were experiencing some difficulties and supporting them to either get back into the workforce, get them back into education, or just providing that kind of um, positive support that's going to help people um, get their life back on track. There are positions available in that, that area as well. So there's a youth worker, um, as an indig Indigenous mentor, a disability employment consultant, and we're more focused on one-on-one -on -one support. And we've been talking about health promotion a lot, so encouraging people to in engage in healthy behaviours and preventing people from engaging in, in health risk behaviours like smoking. Uh, and there's positions available in, in these areas as well. At the moment, there's health promotion project coordinator around women's mental health and promoting women's mental health. There's... We, we see quite a few of these actually, um, a health promotion officer around the area of sexual health, particularly around um, in, in the period of adolescence, and there's one they're targeted on at Indigenous communities. So that's about trying to develop ways in which we'll encourage people to engage in uh, healthier, healthier behaviour. So to, how, do, how do you go about it? How do you get a career in health? There are a few avenues to be able to do this. I do think it is useful to think about further study, university study. Uh, I think that really does set you up for um, to be in a good position to be able to get these careers in health and helping. Work experience is also good, and some of these positions that I saw were also offering volunteer work, um, and that can sometimes be useful if you are, you know, thinking long term to be able to get into these kind of volunteering positions as a way to kind of lead into more permanent employment later down the track. We do have um, a bachelor degree here that I think is, is very much targeted around health and helping people. We, it's our Bachelor of Human Sciences. It's a three-year degree. Um, we actually send people out to organisations to do a work-related placement in their second or third year. And this is not work experience where you'll be sent away for a week and the company will get you to do a little bit of filing or you know, get them to make you a cup of tea. They work, these students. You, you will be allocated to a project and you will really gain some really valuable skills. Some of our students actually got sent overseas. Um, some of them just got back from, from um, Fiji, I think it was, uh, somewhere in the Pacific Islands and were saying, you know, it was such a good experience. With our degree, um, you choose two majors. And so you'll see that they're, they're really targeted around health, helping people, community services, communication, counselling, those sorts of areas. So this, we, we see this as a really good degree for people who are interested in careers in health and helping people. But other degrees around psychology, social work, anything to do with sort of social sciences would be a good um, avenue to, to pursue, to think about a career in health and helping. Um, and again, have a look for volunteering opportunities or, and work experience in related fields. And some of these, some of these opportunities, you do have to start at a, a lower level and gradually work your way up. Um, but as I said, I think this is a really rewarding area. Um, it's a growing area. And, you know, the people that you meet and the work that you get to do is so rewarding because you do feel like you are making a positive difference in people's lives. They are sought after. That is a very uh, good career um, to be interested in. Um, one of my former students, actually, she was a psychology graduate and she started in the area of school counselling, uh, really enjoyed it, really enjoyed working with young people. Um, there is a few different avenues in being able to, to get to that position as well. So psychology degree, uh, degrees in counselling um, are good pathways to be able to think about guidance counselling. We have seen smoking rates decline quite substantially over the past 20 to 30 years. 
Um, they're not 100, they can't sort of pinpoint on exactly what's the most effective because things have been happen happening simultaneously. So at the same time we saw advertising bans, we saw changes that, you know, miners couldn't purchase cigarettes. So often these things are happen happening simultaneously. The thing about, yes, smartphones and apps, now that is a really growing area. Um, I'm not 100% sure how much it contributes to declines in smoking rates, but I know that there is a lot of work being done around the use of smartphones and trying to get people to be more physically active, um, watching what they eat, um, and treatment as well. So for people who may have been diagnosed with some sort of illness like cancer, there is work being done in using the smartphone as a way to kind of monitor um, adherence to treatment plans. So that is a really exciting area. Um, and I think that it's going to really, I think it's, it's, it's sort of outpacing the, the, the number of people who are working in the field it's because industry are involved as well. So Nike have their own apps and things like that. Um, so that, that is a good question. I'm sorry I can't give you a specific answer in terms of how much it's contributed to declines in smoking rates, um, but it's definitely um, a big factor in health promotion. Like I said, I really, I really did not know what I wanted to do after high school, but I did have an interest in people um, and the way people behaved and the choices that they made and the way we think and so I guess that attracted me to psychology in the first place and you know anyone who is studying psychology as you as you study psychology you tend to diagnose absolutely everybody around you so you will diagnose your parents and your, your siblings and your friends and you, you, you find you've got all these disorders as well um, but I, yeah I just had a general interest in people and the way people um, interacted and so that kind of attracted me to um, psychology. And, you know, even while I was studying my degree, I still didn't know where it would take me, but I just found it really interesting. And so I, put, I kept at it. Um, and afterwards, you know, for me, I really just wanted to go and see the world. So I went and travelled for a couple of years, but I, I knew that I wanted to get back. And, and I guess I, I kind of helped consolidate that I found research quite interesting in the area of health and helping people. And that kind of helped me you know, decide to go on and do a master's and then a PhD in the area. Um, I am quite interested in gender and health and the, how boys and girls and men and women um, make different health choices and the role that, um, you know, our upbringing and the culture that we live in, how that impacts upon um, choices, gender choices. So, I, you know, like I find it interesting when they're developing smoking campaigns and they see that, you know, teenage girls are more likely to be smoking now that they, the way they developed that campaign was targeted um, to, to women and it would have been different if it was targeted to men. So, I don't know, I just think that you, if you, you really follow what you're interested in, then it will lead you to somewhere that you end up enjoying where you're working and I think that that makes it a you know, I really, it's really worthwhile, it's really satisfying for me. Because um, when I did travel for a couple of years, I was working in a few jobs, <laughs> oh, just terrible. Um, and that kind of also pushed me to sort of go back to further study as well. I do think that my work with the Salvation Army has probably been the most rewarding experience. So um, I have done some research with, um, you know, university students and I have been involved in this big national survey of Australian women um, that's been going on for about 20 years now and I've analysed some data from that. But I just found that, you know, just going out into the Salvation Army, into the shelters and just, you know, seeing how these people were impacted upon these difficult life circumstances that they could have. And then to think that something that we were doing could potentially, you know, even if it didn't reach everybody, it could just reach a couple of people and make a positive difference and help them. I think that that was really, really satisfying and really rewarding. Quite a few pathways. Um, so many universities now offer degrees in 
psychology, bachelors of psychological science, um, different universities title their degrees slightly differently, but there are quite a few degrees available uh, or, or offered um, to study psychology. Um, sometimes psychology can be quite competitive to get into, and I do think, but that doesn't mean that, you know, you can't end up working in the area of helping people. Um, so, like, the, the degree that I showed, the Bachelor of Human Sciences with a major in counselling would also enable people to be able to go out and, and work with people in that kind of supportive mentor relationship. Um, but yeah, there are lots of degrees in psychology and often you can do a dual degree as well. So if you're interested in psychology, but you're also interested in teaching, um, you can do a combined degree. It will take a, an extra year than just a standard degree. Um, but yeah, that, that's an option as well. And uh, some students do psychology and law as well. Um, so, and these, these go together quite well. So, you know, you definitely draw, will draw upon both of the degrees and what you learn from both of the degrees uh, for, career, for your career. Psychology tends to be four years. Um, so you'll have your sort of three years of, usually you have your three years of undergraduate study and then the fourth year we often call an honours year where you'll actually do um, a, a research thesis and that will be a big part of your year where you actually submit an ethics application, like a, just like a, a, you know, a, a real researcher and you'll go out and collect data, you'll come back and analyse it and you'll write it up into... Um, I don't want to scare anyone, but usually around 15, 20,000 words into a thesis. But that's fourth year. That's quite um, a long way away. And your whole degree, they will be preparing you to be able to do that as well. You'll be taught report writing skills and you'll be taught about data analysis. Um, but, yeah, psychology degrees tend to be four years. If you combine it with law, it would probably be five years. Some pe a lot of people do do that. We find that with um, other degrees as well, which are quite competitive, that students will come and study a, a different degree for six months, sometimes a year, um, and then that will help, um, it will bump up their ATAR, and so they'll be able to apply to get into psychology or the, the other degree that they initially had their, their sights set on. Absolutely. And, um, you know, we always take into account if people have done other study, if you've studied at TAFE or if you have work experience as well, that can get taken into account. And universities have bonus point schemes as well for different things that you may have studied. So, um, yeah, there's a lot of different pathways. Yep. Thank you very much and thanks for having me and I want to say all the best with the rest of your studies as well.